Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening, depending where in the world you might be. Uh, today is February 3rd, 2022. And welcome to We'll Work for Food, the New Possibilities Hour. Our special guest today is my friend David Louie. Uh, David is coming to us from Hawaii, one of my favorite places on earth. And uh, uh, he's two hours behind, so it's 6 a.m. for him there, and uh, it's a pleasure to have David here. David's talk today is going to be about from the desk of the Attorney General on uh, telling about what it is like when you're involved with negotiation, settlement, the behind the scenes of what it is with uh, state government, etc., David was the Attorney General of Hawaii uh, beginning in 2010, and I'm sure he has lots of stories to tell. He actually has put it together, his stories in his book, which was a, which is available on um, um, Amazon, among other places. So let me just share. This is what it looks like, and I wanted to show the, the front cover of it for a special reason, because this is the front of the special desk, all right? The desk that you used as attorney general, and it is a, a historic Koa wood desk in Hawaii State Capitol. And so anyway, that's it for the show and tell for this uh, part of it. And we'll go back to the regular uh, part. David is a civil or has been a civil trial lawyer. He's presently with, uh, and if I butcher this, I apologize, Kobayashi, uh, Sugila Goda and Goda and in um, Honolulu and he's a mediator a as well an ADR professional he has been a civil trial lawyer in practice for uh, he was 32 years when he became attorney general so at this point more than 40 years I would say then all right <laughs> and uh, David and I first met about 20 years ago and it is indeed my pleasure to have him here with us today his his um, his charity or his food bank is the Hawaii Food Bank, and Natalie's putting the um, the link in the um, chat for you to be able to make donations to that. And then, speaking of donations, uh, we're coming up on a quarter of a million dollars, I believe. So, um, where are we today, then, Jeff? Gene, thank you. I'm so happy to announce that our audience have been so generous in contributing in honor of our wonderful speakers. So far, our generous audiences have contributed $234,383 to food banks worldwide. Wow. This is our 100th episode of, uh, of the Will Work for Food project. Natalie's been keeping track. So whether you're toast, depending on what time zone you're in, you might be toasting with champagne or you might have a protein smoothie the way I do or <laughs> the way Natalie does in France or so whatever you have in honor of 100 episodes. And Natalie, how, uh, how fantastic it was that this is all your brainchild. You created it in the spring of 2020 at the beginning of the lockdown. Acknowledgements, thanks, gratitude to you, Natalie, for all that you've done. Thanks so much for inviting me to be part of it. I know Jean feels the same way. Jean, back to you. Absolutely. What there's what a difference one person can make in the world. So that's two to what uh, one to two million meals, uh, just from our humble group. And those are only the donations that someone has told uh, Natalie about. So I'm sure there's much more that's been donated that we haven't even heard about. So anyway, thank you all for your generosity. And uh, without further ado, uh, David, the floor is yours. Gene, thank you very much. Aloha, everybody. Uh, good morning, and it's a, a pleasure to see you. Before I forget, let me just give a shout out to my friends who I see on screen, Sid Kanazawa, Chuck Crumpton, and Elliot Hicks, great lawyers, mediators, arbitrators, and people. Uh, and Gene, of course, who I've known for decades. Uh, and thank you so much for the opportunity to just chat with you folks about my experience and, and uh, see if any of it resonates with you. 
Um, uh, so what, what I'm going to do, I don't have a PowerPoint. I'm just going to talk. I'm a talking head, which is going to be sad, but I'm going to try and make it uh, entertaining for you folks and, and, and tell you. And there's Mimi Castillo, one of my great friends also. So anyway, um, you know, I'm just like a lot of you guys. Uh, I was, I, I've been a mediator, arbitrator. I've been a, a lawyer trying cases for uh, 40 plus years. I started back in 78 and did a lot of stuff. Uh, settled a lot of cases, mediated a lot of cases. Uh, and then 10 years ago, I got a rare opportunity. I was appointed to be the Attorney General of the State of Hawaii by Governor Neil Abercrombie. And it was a sideways move, uh, in some ways a blind leap of faith, uh, but I, I jumped into it and I had the rare opportunity to take a high-speed elevator up to the C-suite, the executive offices of state government, where I I got to make all kinds of decisions. I got a seat at the table. I was in the room where it happens. Uh, I got to meet with uh, all kinds of people. I, I provided uh, it, uh, representation, counsel, advice to everybody in the state, from the governor and the state agencies and department heads, all the way down to the guys uh, digging the trenches out in the streets um, for everything. And the state has, you know, it's the largest law firm uh, in the state of Hawaii, and it has a tremendous reach and a tremendous amount of things on its plate. Uh, I, I got to do amazing things with amazing people. Uh, I got to meet national leaders uh, uh, from our, our great nation, and I even got to, to meet uh, uh, international leaders. So I, I got to do all kinds of things. It was the best job I ever had, ever. And, and, um, you know, Bill Clinton is rumored to have said he was AG of Arkansas before he became governor and then president. And he, he once said, supposedly, this is what the lore of AGs is, is that it was the best job ever because you could do what you thought was right. And when people got pissed off at you, you would just blame the Constitution. OK, and so so that's what I got to do um, is I got to do these. It was a total fire hose experience. Uh, it was you know, I once had the, the rare opportunity to, to go visit a, 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 a nuclear carrier, the USS Nimitz, in the RIMPAC exercises. We flew in, uh, uh, and then when we left, we got shot off by a steam catapult. Zero to 125 miles per hour in 2.5 seconds. It was better than any Disney e-ticket ride. That's a very old a reference for, for the old people here. Uh, but it was terrific. You know, and that's what it was like to be AG. One minute you're minding your own business, and the next minute you're flying at jet speed, and all kinds of things are coming at you. Um, and and then you know, I, I served for four years. Governor Abercrombie could not get reelected. I, I got to sit in the high councils and make all kinds of decisions. And then uh, one day in December, my term ended by statute, and it was the opposite of being shot off. The deck of the USS Nimitz. It was, in fact, when I flew in and got caught by the tail hook. One minute you're flying along at jet speed, and then suddenly, boom, you're jerked to a stop. It was over. The ride was over, but it was the ride of my life, quite frankly. And then I, I went back to private practice. And, and so one of the things that I wanted to talk about with you folks today is my experience and, and how you know, after I rebuilt my practice and how I, uh, what, what I did as, as a AG made me a better lawyer, a better mediator, a better arbitrator. Uh, it made me understand the process a little bit more. Um, you know, I, I, I work as a mediator arbitrator with a DPR, which is Dispute Prevention and Resolution in, in Honolulu. And some of this may be of, of interest to you folks. Uh, now, some of you may think, wait, 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 wait. Government, that's a bunch of crazy people. Politics, these people are idiots and irrational. They have no clue what they're doing. They, you know, and this is no way to run a country, okay? But, you know, when you when you go into government, and some of you have, I know Elliot has, when, when you go into government, you find out that, you know, there are processes. If government is not a black box. It's, it's actually very understandable. It's just different processes. And, you know, at its very heart, what we did in government, what you do as mediators and arbitrators is the same thing. It's all conflict resolution, okay? 
whether it's legislators trying to craft legislation or governors trying to implement ambitious programs, you're taking competing interests and trying to bridge the gap and resolve differences and solve the disputes and move on and trying to do it for the common good, bringing people together with dignity and respect and, and, and trying to, you know, make a difference. And so, you know, I've always thought, especially in Hawaii, where, where we have a large Japanese American population and, they, and there's there used to be a, a sumo matches on TV, sumo wrestling. I have always thought of government and politics as a sumo match. You have half naked, sometimes fully naked interests in a ring, pushing, shoving, seeking dominance, power, authority, money, influence. Um, and that's what government's all about. But so is mediation and arbitration, just writ a little bit smaller, just not, you know, uh, as many people. And the rules are different. You know, the rules are different. You got uh, uh, Being in litigation, mediation, arbitration, the rules are highly stylized. It's, you know, if you were to compare it to government and politics, it's uh, litigation is just like a boxing match with a referee. But politics, that's like a street brawl outside a bar. Um, there are very few rules. And so, you know, I had a, a, a lot of uh, uh, learning to do uh, moving into that world. Uh, but my, my uh, career as a lawyer helped me. It held me in good stead. And, and so it was a steep learning curve, but I got a great education. And now, before I talk about that education I got, let me talk and give a shout out to the Hawaii Food Bank. The Hawaii Food Bank is a terrific organization. You know, a lot of people think, hey, you guys live in paradise. Everybody's rich. Uh, there, there's no problems in Hawaii. It's paradise. Well, you know, somebody's got to do the job here. They got to ring the cash registers up. Uh, they've got to make the world go round. Uh, you know, you've got, you've got tons of ordinary people doing extraordinary things to make our economy go. And when the pandemic hit, I mean, we already had a problem because it was like one out of eight people in Hawaii had food insecurity. But when the pandemic hit, we really went to like one out of six, one out of five people. It was, you know, people lost their jobs, our economy cratered, and, and the food bank was there with all kinds of programs. I don't have to tell you guys that food insecurity is a huge problem. You know, it's, it's, it's like number one of the foundational blocks of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If you don't have food, <laughs> you could care less about justice, okay? Uh, you could care less about solving disputes. You just want some food and you are willing to lie, cheat, steal, and kill to feed your children. So food insecurity is huge. And what this organization does is huge. And what Hawaii Food Bank does is gigantic. So please donate, donate to Hawaii Food Bank or donate to others. Uh, they play a critical role, uh, just like all of you do, in keeping things moving and keeping our society moving and, and uh, going along. So now let me tell you uh, about what I learned in my time as AG. Uh, and uh, uh, I had the privilege to, to resolve a number of thorny, uh, uh, long-standing disputes. And what I thought I'd do is, is just talk about a couple of them and talk about the process uh, of, of government as well as the process of dispute resolution, which I think, whether it's government, mediation, arbitration, or even litigation, it's, it's largely the same. Um, you know, you have to understand the process, first off. Right. I mean, that was the first thing I had to learn was, well, what's the processes in state government? Um, you know, politics is said to be the art of the possible. Um, it's uh, and, and that's really true. It is all about making the deal. But you have to make the deal. You have to go to where other people are. You can't just, um, you know, shout in the wilderness about your viewpoint. Well, if you read uh, Robert, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, Robert Caro's books about Lyndon Johnson, Lyndon Johnson, who was an enormously complex man, but but um, a great president and did some great things. He was very critical of people like Hubert Humphrey, who would make wonderful sounding flowery speeches, but could not 
get the legislation through. And if you can't get the legislation through, if you can't cut the deal, if you can't close the mediation and arbitration, well, then you haven't done anything, really. You, you've left people where they are. So it's really important for uh, 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 people who are going into government and mediators and arbitrators to totally understand the process, understand uh, uh, the rules, understand the dimensions. And really, this is the, the thing I learned, is you have to make sure that people who are participating understand that the process is fair and reasonable. Because if they don't believe the process is fair, then they're not gonna be satisfied with the result. Um, and, and that's one of the things about our system is, and I think mediation and arbitration, if people believe that they have been heard, that they've been treated with dignity and respect, uh, and, and that they've had an opportunity to talk, then they can many times accept the result, even if it's adverse. And so my role in government was to move the process along. Uh, I had a particular role as, as the AG, you know, I was advising people, uh, but there are different roles for mediators and arbitrators. And you have to understand what is your role? Are you an arbitrator? Are you the judge essentially? Uh, or are you an advocate, a lawyer, or are you a mediator? And whether, you know, depending on what your role is, regardless of what it is, the important thing in my mind was to make sure that people understood that it was a fair and reasonable process. And one of the key elements that I think is really important uh, that I had to learn uh, and, and was, you know, uh, was something that, that I constantly worked on, and I think people as mediators and arbitrators have to work on, is engendering trust. You know, if people don't trust you, uh, it's not going to work. They, they, that's the whole deal about what makes commerce go around. And uh, when people trust the process, when people trust uh, that things are safe and that people will do what they say they will do, where the rule of law is involved, they will invest their time, energy, and confidence. But if you don't trust what's going to happen, you're in a third world country where, where there's a dictatorship and they might take your property, you're not going to invest. And the same thing in a mediator. If you don't trust the mediator, you're not going to tell the mediator what you really think. Uh, you're not going to tell them where your push points and, uh, are and, and how you might uh, do that. But I will say this, getting trust is not something that you get to do. It, it's earned. It's not, uh, you can't command trust, you know, uh, you, you have to, you have to, Put yourself out there, tell people, you know, all about yourself. And they might trust you because of your experience and your roles and, and because they want to, but, but they may not, they may not. And, and one important thing that I learned is, is that my role as a, a leader, uh, and I think that that's true of the role of mediators, is the difference between being a mountaineer and a mountain guide. A mountaineer wants to get to the top of Everest. It's all about individual achievement. But for a leader, if you're running a department, if you're running an agency, if you're mediating a dispute, your job is to get the group to the top of the mountain. It's not your individual aggrandizement. It is what's going on with the group. What are the dynamics? What's happening with everybody else? What's you know, how are we going to get everybody to yes? Because, you know, in a mediation arbitration, it only takes one person to screw it all up uh, and to throw a monkey wrench in and say, no, I'm not, I'm not settling. And then the whole thing falls apart. And, and arbitrators, arbitrators are like judges. You know, there's an old saying I love, which is whenever there's a trial, the judge is on trial as well as the parties. And that's true. Uh, and when there's an arbitration, it's the same thing. The arbitrator's on trial. Are you an honorable person? Are you trustworthy? Can you do, you know, a, a fair job? So all of things are, these things are important. And, and one of the things I learned was that government attorneys are guardians of the process. They, they represent both the, the state interests 
but they also have an obligation to make sure that the process is fair and that the sanctity and the procedures are followed so that everybody thinks that the whole thing is a fair process. And I think mediators and arbitrators are the same. We're all guardians of the process. We are all making sure that people believe that the process is fair and reasonable and will result in some result that they can actually live with and, and that, that can happen. So, you know, those are really important things as a mediator arbitrator. And, and when I was AG, you have to understand the problem. You have to try and understand the dimensions of the problem. You have to understand the people because they're the key. Um, one of my friends who's uh, uh, Mike Turpin, he, he, he was uh, Oklahoma attorney general and, and uh, uh, he ran for governor, but unsuccessfully, but he always used to say was on election day, the needs of the people have to meet up with the candidates qualities and what they deliver. And that's who gets elected on that day of election. Um, and it's the same thing, I think, with mediation and arbitration. Can you meet the needs of the participants? You know, whatever they may be, they may be money, rational rationality, it may be ideology, it, 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 it may be some emotional need. But, you know, it's understanding the people, understanding who the decision makers are, under, getting them all in the room, uh, and making sure that that happens. And that is critical uh, in order to get to yes, in order to resolve a dispute. And so, you know, those are all the things that, that uh, I had to understand, um, which I think uh, plays over to, to uh, mediators and arbitrators. When I was trying to get compromises, who are the decision makers? Who do I need to talk to? Who, who can actually make a decision here? Uh, uh, and, and will they focus on what we're talking about, or are they going to be distracted by, by something else? And then what are the reasons that they are doing their, I mean, what are the reasons, what are the factors, what are the hot button issues that will influence their decision-making process? One of the things Governor Abercrombie used to tell me was, people will do things for their reasons, not yours. And, and you know, that's true. You can talk till you're blue in the face, and if they're not buying your reasons, well, sorry, <laughs> you're not getting agreement, okay? And so the question is, is well, how are we going to find out what are their reasons? And that, you know, when I had to go negotiate uh, on legislation or talk to the governor or talk to agency heads, I wanted to know what, what, what's going on. What are you trying to do? What are your reasons? What are the hot button factors for you? What are the most important factors? And what are all the other factors uh, that, that, that exist? And so you, you wanna find those things out. And, and unless you can do that and find out and, and understand their reasons, and then maybe bring them around to your reasons, maybe talk to them about the rationality of their reasons, or try and change the narrative as to the value of their reasons and whether or not keeping the dispute alive and being able to have their reasons and talk on a street corner and give their point of view is less valuable than solving a dispute and moving on with their lives. Unless you can do that, you're not gonna have a deal. And it's all about getting the deal and closing uh, the matter. So. The other thing I will say is that you're going to have tests. And one of the, the surprising things to me is going into attorney general's office was the tests. The tests that come at you and you're never quite knowing where they're going to come from, and, uh, but they're there. And, and I had a lot of tests. Uh, I, I constantly had politicians and lobbyists testing me. What are you made of, kid? Uh, can I push you around? Can I achieve dominance over you? Can I make you do what I want you to do? Um, and, and so, you know, people would do stupid things. Eh, they'd want me to do illegal things. They'd want me to cut corners. They'd want me to give special favors. And I was like, no, I don't think so. Okay. And, and so 
you're going to get tests. I got tested. I got tested constantly. There were a lot of them. Um, and you'll get tested as a mediator and as an arbitrator. You know, people are going to push your boundaries. And, and you have to expect it because, it, you know, in government, there's a lot of money. There's power. There's influence. Uh, and there's all kinds of things at stake. And so, unfortunately, people will say or do things that, you know, you wouldn't countenance, you wouldn't allow between friends, but that's the whole thing. These guys aren't your friends. And in a mediation and arbitration, they're not your friends. You're an impediment to them getting what they want. All right. And so they are going to push and they're going to try and get you to do something. And so you just have to understand it. You know, there's an old saying. Uh, it was credited with Harry Truman. If you want a friend in Washington, get a dog. Okay. And, and, you know, that, that was one of the things I, I learned, like, I'm doing my job, you're doing your job. Uh, we might be friends later, but I'm not going to worry about it. Uh, let's do our jobs. Okay. You want to test me? Fine. Bring it on. Y you want to try and play me as a mediator? and not tell me the real story, shame on you because you'll lose the opportunity to settle because I'm really trying to help you. But if that's what you want to do, if you want to, if you want to have me be your advocate and go over and beat the other guy on the head and say why well, you're right and he's wrong, well, guess what? That's what he wants me to do. <laughs> and if that's what we're going to be doing, well, then we're just going to be talking past one another. We're not going to get communication. We're not going to get understanding and we're not going to get a resolution. So, um, you know, just remember there are going to be those tests and, and, and they're going to come along. And, and so you have to be prepared, but don't take them personally. Um, you know, don't take anything personally because the, the stakes are high and you just have to understand that is the process. And, and you just have to keep working at it to make people understand it's not a zero sum game. Even if it's just about money and it's an insurance company and they wanna give less and the plaintiff wants to get more, it's still not a zero sum game because there's a win-win there where everybody moves on. The insurance company gets a win because they stop spending money for defense attorneys. They close their books. The plaintiffs move on because they get something. Maybe it's not every dollar they want. Maybe it's not total validation that they wanted, but they get an opportunity to be heard and they get to move on with their lives uh, because there's a lot more important things than being in a dispute and fighting, okay? Uh, it creates stress. It creates anxiety. <laughs> it's bad for your health. And so there's always a win-win. There's, you know, and, and that's part of our job as mediators is understanding it's not a zero sum game. So now let me, let me talk uh, about one of the signature uh, things that I got to do that I was really proud of uh, in state government was um, I, I got to be involved in a lot of things, but one of the biggest was legalization of same sex marriage. Um, and, and that was huge for me because it was, it was personally satisfying because it was a, a social justice issue, a civil rights issue, and an issue of basic dignity and humanity. Um, and, and, you know, today a large number of Americans and people in Hawaii uh, think that everybody should be able to marry the person they love uh, the, and, and, they, and, and spend their lives with them. Uh, but, you know, this was a long, hard fought Kind of thing that spanned decades and and for many people you know when we were all growing up there was lots of discrimination against gays lots of, and it continued on um you know the hawaii uh, supreme court was an early leader in this fight because it, it came out in 1993 with a the first state supreme court decision that said hey wait a minute this is just like loving versus virginia this is a matter of basic human dignity and the equal protection provision of the Constitution, the Hawaii State Constitution governs this, and you cannot discriminate against gay and lesbian couples. Oh my God, you would have thought the 
the sky was falling because the backlash was tremendous back in 1993. State legislators uh, denounced uh, the Supreme, the Hawaii Supreme Court. Everybody rushed to go pass a constitutional amendment so that their discrimination could be enshrined at the highest levels uh, of the Constitution so then they could uh, fight back against the Equal Protection Amendment. And it was a terrible, terrible time. Uh, even in Hawaii, we had, we had a, a, a movement to have a constitutional amendment. Uh, but over, over 20 years, over time, things changed. And, and eventually, you know, the, the U.S. Supreme Court on litigation uh, ruled that, that that was unconstitutional. Uh, in the Windsor case, uh, in, the, in the Hollingsworth case, and later on in the Obergefell case. Uh, and these were important rights. So I, I was happy to be involved in this. Um, my first involvement, and I wanted to tell you the story about this, came when I had to make a trade-off of my own personal vanity, uh, which is huge, uh, you know, as Gene knows. Um, uh, and and uh, my bully pulpit and, and talking about things that I thought was right, I had to trade that off in order to get a deal done. And so here's what happened. Um, before uh, the Supreme Court, the, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled, uh, 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 a group of plaintiffs brought another lawsuit in Hawaii to declare the discrimination unlawful and unconstitutional. And so we had to defend that. As the AG, you're called upon to defend the laws. But there was precedent from uh, uh, Governor uh, uh, Schwarzenegger and Jerry Brown in California, when they were confronted uh, with that choice, they said, you know what? No, we're not going to defend that. I, as the AG, will not defend that. And Eric Holder, when he was confronted with the Windsor, you know, and President Obama, they were confronted with the Windsor case as that was moving up. Eric Holder said, I'm not going to defend that law. It is wrong. It is unconstitutional. And so I wanted to do the same thing. And Governor Abercrombie says, let's stand together. We'll do this. We'll, we'll come out strong. We're, we're not going to defend the law. And I said, that's great. Let's do that. And then I went to talk to some legislators, the legislative leaders. Now, the legislative leaders, Senate president, you know, vice president and, and, and House and all those guys, they're very jealous of their authority to pass the laws and make policy. And they don't want people saying, no, your laws are unconstitutional. So they actually, they were concerned about this. Uh, and they said, oh, well, you know, a, a, a couple of them said to me, you know, if you do that, I'm going to jeopardize and I'm not going to let through another big deal you have going. And I had a big deal going. I had just concluded some landmark negotiations to settle a huge native Hawaiian dispute uh, on monies that were owed to a native Hawaiian state agency by the state over crown lands, revenues from ceded lands, which are called crown lands, which had been taken in the illegal overthrow of the Hawaiian kingdom. You know, Hawaii is an interesting place because it once was a kingdom. It was illegally overthrown by by a, a small group of, of planters and, and citizens with the complicity of the United States government who annexed Hawaii. And they took hundreds of thousands of acres uh, that, that, you know, were used. And those, a bunch of them were given back to the state. And, and so people, there, there, was, there was monies due from the rent from those, uh, but there was a dispute. And, and I gotta tell you, um, Native Hawaiian issues uh, those were the most complex, most fraught issues. And, and I know a lot of people deal with Native Americans and Native Alaskans, and, and they're very similar. But, you know, Native Hawaiians are, are a minority in their own homeland now. Uh, maybe 10% of the people, if you identify one ra single race, uh, it goes up to 27% because there's been a lot of intermarriage when you identify two races. But... Native Hawaiians have been treated badly over the years. Uh, they have not uh, uh, shared in the riches and the prosperity that other groups have gotten out of Hawaii. And so there's a palpable sense of grievance and, and disenfranchisement, and, and, and it's a problem. These are very complicated issues. So anyway, we had gotten this deal. We were going to give the, uh, 
uh, agency, uh, $200 million of prime real estate in Honolulu, in lieu of giving them $400 million of cash that they wanted uh, and, and that they thought they were entitled to. But by state law, if you're gonna transfer land, the legislature has to approve it. So the legislature told me, guess what? Your big deal is dead if you want to do what you want to do and not defend us on same-sex marriage. And I thought, huh, okay. Um, how are we going to get out of this thicket? All right. And the, the solution, my solution, was a little bit out of the box, and I always commend people for out-of-the-box thinking. I was able to find a way because of the uniqueness of the Attorney General's office. By statute, the Attorney General can represent everybody and has to represent everybody, okay? But we don't have the same conflict of interest rules for the Attorney General. It is a unique exception. And because the, the plaintiffs in that case had sued both the governor and the director of health, I said, well, how about this? Governor, you attack the law. You say, it's unconstitutional, it's wrong, we should not discriminate. I will have a team and we will defend the law because we're supposed to defend laws and, and I won't do that. And so we agreed on that. I got the legislative leaders to agree to that. They supported the OHA deal. We got that through. It was a big deal. I was really happy to be involved in that. And, and we moved forward on same-sex marriage. And then after the U.S. Supreme Court ruled, um, the governor called a special session. Uh, we had all kinds of testimony. Um, uh, you know, every we had demonstrations. It was noisy. It was raucous. Um, and well, the, the, I got to testify. I testified that that it was a pivotal moment in Hawaii history, and it was important to do the right thing. Um, but. But it was back and forth. There were demonstrations with busloads of people with megaphones making noise at all hours of the day and night. Um, and, and then finally, the bill was passed to legalize same-sex marriage. Um, and the governor read a letter at, at the signing ceremony. It was very moving about how one of his family friends said, <clears throat> those who were invis invisible are now visible. You know, people had come out of the shadows, essentially. And I thought it was an important moment. Um, and so I was really proud to be to be part of that. Um, but the fight was still not over. An immediate lawsuit went in to challenge that. I went down and argued the motion to dismiss, got it thrown out, and, and we were upheld. And, and, and fights still continue. But let me tell you the lessons I learned from that. First, the special session was critical, okay? Um, getting the, the uh, people to focus on a single gigantic issue, uh, not in the regular session, was incredible. And that's the same thing for a mediation. You got to get the people in the room if you can. You know, Zoom is okay, but it's not quite as good, you know, because you, they're not as focused. They're still distracted from making a deal and cutting a deal. And then the second uh, thing that I learned was uh, uh, getting the OHA deal done was, was really huge so I could, we could go forward with that, that lawsuit and the OHA settlement, uh, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs Settle. And I was able to meet the needs of the legislative leaders so they would not kill my other deal. Uh, my vanity, as big as my ego is, could go by the wayside. Um, and, 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 and so it's important to, to do that and to have a fair process and to have something where people got to have their say. They were treated with dignity and respect. They all got their chance to, to testify. And in general, you know, unlike President Trump, and I know there's some people who support President Trump, but uh, unlike people who think that that election was stolen and won't accept the result, most people, if you go through a fair process, like an election or a mediation or an arbitration, you'll accept the, the result, even if it is adverse. And so um, 
those are many of the things I learned. I, I had lots and lots of other things. Uh, I, I, we were able to, to do a conservation easement, uh, get a deal in. I parachuted in to, to, at the last minute during the legislative session uh, to, to, to cut a deal um, uh, and get $40 million of bonding authority done uh, uh, in order to, to protect 665 acres uh, up at Turtle Bay and stop 4,000 housing units and five hotels uh, uh, from being built. Uh, but I had a very short time, and, and so I was able to cut the deal with, with the, the opposing side um, and, and get the legislative uh, approval for that. That's where I saw the sausage being made in the back rooms, where on the very last day of session, I had to go sit there and drink with a bunch of legislators who were celebrating while I waited to be summoned up to talk to the Ways and Means Chair and the, and the House Finance Chair about the final language to, to get our, our prog project through. Those are, those are just some wonderful stories. But what I learned in government that from, from all of that experience was that, you know, it, it's, it's a big job and I think it's important that the government uh, solve big problems. And it's the best vehicle in my mind to solving big problems. And mediators are, and arbitrators are a great way to solve problems. Uh, better than courts, which are overwhelmed and slow. Um, uh, so it's, it's really important what, what everybody on this call does, I know. Uh, the other thing I learned is, is that, you know, civic engagement and civic virtues and the common good are huge and that we are best when we're all acting together and we're all trying to solve a problem rather than throw rocks and demonize the other side. And, and, and although it's hard to recognize the basic humanity in other people, that's what you have to do and you have to treat them with respect and dignity in order to get a deal. And, and I will say this, governing is hard. It's not for the faint of heart. Uh, mediating is hard, not for the faint of heart. Uh, a lot of emotion, especially in family disputes. Um, but, but even in not, you know, e even in money disputes, it, there's a lot of emotion. And, and so it's important that, that you recognize the cycles, the social dynamics, the timing, uh, of, of those things. And, and, um, uh, 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 factor those in and try and, and get the deal done uh, and, and help to demystify the process. Um, so that's, that's really uh, what it is. Uh, I, I, the other thing that let me just mention very briefly, what I learned about leadership, which I think is important because I think as mediators and arbitrators, you are all leaders uh, and, and many of you are leaders in your community. Um, I think it's important if you put yourself out there and let people know what you're doing and why you're doing it, they will appreciate it. One of my friends ran for Congress, John Radcliffe, who passed away recently, a great man. He ran for Congress and he didn't win. But after he ran for Congress, people said, you know, that was a gutsy thing to do. We really want you to, to come along and help us do these other things. Um, and, and so letting people know what you do is, is really important and stepping out of your comfort zone. Uh, the other thing that, that I learned, and this was a story I got from Chuck Breyer, who's a U.S. District Court judge, the brother of uh, Stephen Breyer, uh, the Supreme Court Justice. Uh, Chuck Breyer told me this story about a legendary consigliere lawyer in California who used to carry around a small pocket, pocket notebook. And, and people would ask him for favors all the time, and he would write it down in his notebook and then the secret that he had was trying to do something immediately. Because if you, if somebody asks you for a favor and you say, sure, I'll take care of it. And then if you do it, if you pick up the phone right there, or you do something that day and then you get back to them, they're going to think, God, that guy really cared about me. They, 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 I meant something to that person even if you don't get success. And if you get success, my God, you are a magician, okay? And the curve of gratitude is way up there, way up there. But if you wait a week, if you wait a month, 
If you wait until that person calls you and says, hey, were you able to do this thing for me? Even if you got the best result, the curve of gratitude is down there. Okay? And it's all about meeting the needs of people. So I, I would just say, when you're gonna do something, strike as soon as you can. Do it and, and you know, act. And, and that's, you know, mediators and arbitrators, act on what you think are the key points. So let me pause there. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop talking at you guys and try and talk with you. Um, I've, uh, Gene, uh, Jeff, if you guys wanna throw questions at me, I, I'm seeing a couple of questions here, one from, from uh, uh, Karen Orlin uh, about, and, and if, you, if it's okay, Gene, nod, uh, just tell me, I'll go ahead and just, just go ahead. some sure, of these go questions. Ahead. The question from Karen is, how have you successfully engaged in discussion with opposition that refuses to disclose reasons and facts underlying the opposition's uh, position? Uh, terrific question, terrific question, because like I said earlier, people are, sometimes they want you to go beat up on the other side. And so, you know, the first thing I do in these situations is I ask them, well, educate me, you know, help me out. What are your key factors? What do you need to make a decision? What are, what are the things that are important to you? And are, are there some non-rational or, or are there emotional reasons or, or people reasons or things that are a little bit, you know, uh, 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 not as dollars and cents. And what would make you, you know, move your position if you found certain things out? But then I also pose that question to them and say, what do you think the other side's hot button issues are? Tell me about them. And it's in the process of engaging them in trying to help resolve the dispute that I have found some success, not total success. I have, I've cratered a bunch of mediations. Uh, um, I, I have, I, I have uh, been unsuccessful, uh, <laughs> unfortunately. Now, when you're an arbitrator, you just get the rule. So that's a good thing. But, but as a mediator, you know, it's all consensual. And, and so you've got to bring the people to the point where they agree. And, and you, I think by engaging them in the process and putting, ha, helping them understand what you're trying to do and how you can talk to the other side and, and try and get consensus is, is something that, that I would recommend. Uh, it may or may not work. I will say this. I, I had this, uh, I had a, a mediation a little while ago and I just couldn't believe one of the position of the other side and, and, um, or of one side. And I just thought it was totally irrational. Um, and, and I think it was irrational. And, and finally I said, well, guys, I'm going to declare impasse. I, 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 I you know, I, I don't think you guys uh, have evaluated this correctly. Um, and I'm going to tell the other side that, uh, you know, it's over. I'm, uh, we're done. And, and about, you know, and, and, and the lawyer says, whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, uh, why don't you hang on? I'll call you back in 15 minutes. <laughs> and, and then they called me back and, and, uh, said, oh, come on, don't give up. Don't give up. Uh, well, we can make a deal. I'm saying, and I said, well, look, you guys are taking some of the hardest line positions. You're not budging. You're not moving. You're not even telling me anything privately, okay, about your willingness to move. I can't help you. I'm, I'm of no use to you, and I don't want to waste people's time. Um, you know, and I've seen judges. Now, the, the federal judges get to do this. There was a, a, a federal judge now retired. He used to come into the room, and he'd say, you people are wasting my time. I don't have time for your silly, stupid little posturing and your silly, stupid little uh, uh, dispute. So unless you get real, I'm out of here. I'm going to give you five minutes. Uh, and, and we would go, oh, <laughs> that's interesting. That was an interesting approach. You don't get to do that as a mediator. Uh, but but 
<laughs> it was interesting. Okay. Next question. I hope, Karen, I hope that answered your question. Greg Whitehair has a question. How do you manage your emotions when you see your valuable initiatives as AG either dropped or reversed by successors? Ah. <laughs> um, one, um, Greg, that's a great question. Love it. First, you know, when you're AG, you get to sit in the seat, but when you're not AG, sometimes you have to accept defeat. And if your successor comes in and reverses your decision, then you, that's the process. The process is, is we switch out every four years and somebody else gets to make the decision. And if you wanna change that, then you gotta go in and lobby and get legislation or go meet with somebody and do it. But how do you manage your emotions? I, I think the way you manage your emotions is, is you just, you know, put it on the side. You, you, I, you can't get too invested in these things in the sense of being emotional about it. You still have to be rational and understand it's the process. Um, and don't let, I, I mean, yes, I, I, there, were, there were a number of things. There were some things that happened with my successor um, that I went, oh, yeah, I wouldn't have done that. But it was his job. I got to sit in the seat. I got to make the policy decisions. I got to make the litigation decisions. You know, the great thing was, is, is that the statutes in Hawaii give the AG the power. And so there were a number of times when I had to tell powerful people, no, no, we're not doing it your way. We're doing it my way. And that made some of them very unhappy, very unhappy. Um, but I had the statute. I had the constitution. What were they going to do? And so, so when I'm sitting on the opposite side of that and the new AG is telling me, David, no, that stinks. I don't like your, your position, your rationale. I just had to accept it. So uh, that, that's, I think, the, the, the way to manage these emotions. And also the other thing is, is I try not to get emotional on things. I, I try not, you know, it's, it's a, it's a process and it's, it's, <clears throat> uh, it's important when I was a trial lawyer, never to let the opposition know what I was thinking, not to wear my emotions on my sleeve, even when I took a body blow, even when something bad happened, it was like, poker face, poker face, poker face, don't frown. <laughs> don't let them know how badly you're hurt okay uh and so that's what that's what i i i think i'd say um gene any other questions wow i'm going to remember that mountaineering example thank you um you know there's nothing more in the chat did anybody want to raise their hand and ask a question otherwise uh no well you know uh then i'll ask one here david you know over the years we've seen the uh the uh, state AGs uh, settling the tobacco cases, and now I think they've got the opioid cases going. Um, when you're in settlement negotiations on matters like that, how different are they from when you're in settlement negotiations over you know, some commercial uh, litigation matter, for example? That's a great question, uh, Gene. And um, um, so I, I'm now representing some of the opioid manufacturers, um, uh, it, defending the lawsuit by the state AG. Um, and, and so I understand kind of both sides of that equation. Um, when, when I was sitting in the chair, basically my touchstone for decision-making was what do I feel is the right thing to do for the most people for the state? The, the perspective that I tried to have um, was, uh, and it's different, kind of when I became AG, I thought, well, you know, I, I don't have a single client now whose interests are paramount and that I have to subsume my rationale. My client is all of the people of Hawaii, all, everyone the entire state and it's the state and it's the process 
and and it's the whole thing so i have to try and do what i think is right and, and that was like bill clinton said do what you think is right okay uh now you have to be guided by the law and the constitution and the decisions and the statutes uh but i but i tried to do what i thought was right and so that would factor into my decision making process on how i resolve disputes i mean one of the things that, that was great for being a litigator to come into the position is, is that i had a lot of experience in in analyzing litigation and then and, and, and analyzing positions and and then settling disputes and trying to understand that if i thought people were being irrational or or, or, or doing the right thing so so in sitting in the chair, I, I, I think I tried to bring as much of that to bear and negotiate. You know, I would I I would negotiate with legislators uh, over policy matters. I would negotiate with the governor over uh, what he was doing and 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 how I thought. You know, sometimes he needed to modify his position a little, um, but still I was trying to help him as long as it was constitutional and and statutorily allowed um and so i think you just have to you know what's your perspective the perspective was what's best for everyone and and as long as i can do that legally uh that's kind of where i i did that and and that's how i negotiated and and tried to take positions for the state in in resolving its litigation basically because the people of the state were your clients yes um, and yeah so well that's fascinating uh jeff did you have any questions greg's got one more here uh, oh, okay greg's how did you work with the other ags when multiple st states took up a litigation position what were the politics of being on a team with california or texas <laughs> great question greg so the the um uh and i'm, I'm gonna make this really short because we've got a uh, a hard stop and Jeff has got uh, stuff. Um, I participated in the National uh, Association of Attorneys General, bad acronym, NAG, uh, but all the attorneys general would get together uh, and we would do multi-state litigation together. And sometimes we would agree, sometimes we wouldn't. Um, and, and so multiple, it was a consensus process, just like a mediation, just like any other group process you had to bring everybody along. And and so I, I will say California and Texas were kind of the big dogs and sometimes they went their own way. Um, uh, but but we tried to be collaborative and that was that was one of the great joys. I worked on the national mortgage crisis uh, uh, and I continued to see the tobacco litigation uh, aftermath through. And so that was very satisfying. And I think I need, well, there's two minutes left and Jeff, uh, I understand yeah, you've got some closing remarks, so let me turn it over to you. Well, let me thank you, David. That was a fascinating and stimulating presentation. Your insights from experience are it's information we couldn't get anywhere else. So thank you very much. We encourage everybody to contribute to the Hawaii Food Bank or another food bank that's important to them. If they're in a financial position to be able to contribute, Please report your contributions to Natalie so that we can add it to our running total and perhaps make David Louie the answer to that unbelievable bar trivia question that will go down in history for generations. Who is the will work for food speaker who put us over a quarter of a million dollars? Make David Louie the answer to that trivia question. Thanks again, David. Jean. Back to you. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks again, David. I've got the uh, Hawaii Food Bank website up on my other computer. And you know, it says nourish our Ohana, Ohana's family, yes. right in Hawaii and, and uh, donate in the new year and help end hunger for tomorrow. I like that uh, line of theirs too. So uh, anyway, this is the Will Work for Food ohana and it's a pleasure again this week as in every week and thank you so much for being here and for whatever donations you may be able to make have a great week thank, thank you, you all <laughs> thank you